Uh, hey there, Redwood Aid Push. Uh, this is Mr. Eskridge and Mr. Vier. I'm coming at you with Chapter 4, um, Colonial Society. Um, okay, so we have a number of interesting things going on um, within this chapter, and really, we're just kind of going to be hitting on some of the things that we've already talked about, um, but we're really studying up what does, uh, what do the colonies look like prior to the American Revolution, and what's going to kick off, um, what are going to we're going to be the events that are going to cause the colonists to revolt against the mother country, being Britain. Okay, so um, trade in the British Atlantic. Um, so for the most part, North Americans had a higher standard of living than um, those in Europe. Um, although we don't have the, the extreme wealth that we have in Europe um, amongst the landed elite, the people that have been in power um, for a long time, um, we do have a relative number of people that are able to to gain wealth, um, gain, gain political power, economic power, social status um, through um, economic ventures. Maybe um, they were early uh, tobacco planters, um, so on and so forth. Um, and so um, colonists really begin to purchase luxury goods for the first time. We have um, not just the fact that people are making more money, but there's more opportunities for credit. Um, and so people are starting to experience more of a consumer culture in which they're able to, to import goods um, from Europe, so these are finished goods. They're able to kind of compete with each other um, for kind of social clout, if you will. Um, we also see that there's no system of standardized money in the colonies, which will ultimately cause a problem because let's say that you live in Virginia and you um, want to trade with someone in Pennsylvania. They might not um, accept the, the, the currency in Virginia. So um, we see different money systems start to develop. And we really see paper money develop in the colonies for the first time in Western um, history. And so that's going to be really significant um, change as well, um, or development. And we, again, I think Mr. Vieira talked about it in the last um, chapter, this idea of mercantilism. And just a quick reminder, mercantilism is the idea that the colonies exist for the sole purpose of enriching the mother country. And so this idea of mercantilism is really going to start to play out um, in encouraging colonists to eventually revolt against England. So England is going to see that the colonists are experiencing economic growth, wealth, and Britain is going to want to try to put the, um, the reins on that a little bit and be able to exploit and get some of that money. So this is going to um, lead to conflict um, with their colonists um, who don't want Britain to have more control. They don't want to pay taxes. They don't want to um, be told what they can, what they cannot purchase. And so we're going to see pirateering, um, other ventures like that. Um, but ultimately, the American colonies are going to continue this consumer culture um, at whatever cost they can. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rio. All right, so I'm going to go over the structure of colonial society. So the first thing is one of the main differences between American colonial society and European society is that there is no nobility in America. Thomas Jefferson wasn't the Duke of Virginia. He's just Thomas Jefferson. Now, that, that doesn't mean that colonial America didn't have a social structure or a class system. It very much did. But it wasn't based off of necessarily this idea of being a noble. It was pretty much based on wealth and land ownership. Um, the, the merchant elite, especially in the American colonial cities, they pretty much conducted most of the social and political affairs. When we talk about the American Revolution, the guys who are the shot callers, the guys who are making the decision, they're the elite, they're the wealthy, they're the top 1% of their society in terms of uh, economic wealth. Now, there, there are some instances in which there's different professions which are held in higher esteem than others. For example, in New England, if you were a minister or a church leader, that was a position of real high prestige. You were usually... Uh, in a decision-making body, whether it was in town hall meetings or in the city itself, you, ha you had a lot of, of ownership over what was going on within your colony, within your community. In the South, society looks much different than it does in northern cities. Most of the wealth and the decision-making power is concentrated in a few very small and in, in a small number of very wealthy elite families. Uh, and these families are pretty much the ones that control huge swaths of land, and they're making most of the economic and political decisions in the South. There is a class system that develops, uh, and, and the social pyramid for society is pretty much uh, 
slaves on the very bottom, obviously on the very bottom of that pyramid uh, in, in all walks of life, in all parts of, of the colonies. Right above them are laborers, land, landless colonists who are performing a duty. Maybe they're working as, as a farmhand, uh, working on a ship dock, that type of, of unskilled labor. Right above them, shopkeepers, artisans, people with a set skill that they can use to sell uh, and make some profit. And then above them, the merchant elite. If we're talking in northern cities, then it's going to be shipbuilders. It's going to be large business owners. If we're talking about uh, southern society, then it's going to be large plantation owners and, and those men and those families that had a tremendous amount of wealth. All right, so kind of just picking up off of there, um, since we left off in the South. Um, so slavery really develops, as we've seen um, in the last chapter and throughout this chapter, um, slavery really becomes an institution within the colonies. And um, for the most part, slavery, to some extent, touches all 13 colonies. No colony um, is completely removed from this institution of slavery. Um, down in the South, as we've seen in these cash crop economies, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, um, we see that, you know, that is where slavery and as a labor system is really developed. And we see laws. We talked about slave codes last time. Um, we see more slave codes. We see laws that um, protect slave owners against um, violence that they take out on their slaves. It protects um, them from, you know, the justice system, from being held accountable for treating um, their fellow human beings in such a horrific way. And so we really see the development of um laws that make it so that um, slave owners cannot be persecuted for beating, branding, mutilating, um, even castrating um, the, the human beings that were quote unquote um, owned by them. And so um, so that's a really significant issue as well. Another thing that's kind of going on and shows the, um, the agency, um, which means kind of the, the ability of slaves to show their human side is this um, task system that we see in the Carolinas. So in the Carolinas, the primary staple crop is going to be rice. And rice is really interesting because it's really difficult to grow. Um, and it is ridden with disease because you pretty much leave the rice paddies underwater the whole time. So that breeds mosquitoes and all these other bugs. And so Car um, Carolinian um, planters really relied on slaves coming from certain particular points in Africa that had a long history and um, historical knowledge of growing rice. And so... Um, so that's kind of just an interesting dynamic. Um, if you want further information about that, there's a book called Black Rice by Judith Carney that just goes into all that, and it's amazing. Um, but one thing about the task system is that it's it gives a little bit more autonomy to the slaves working in the Carolinas. So the planters, because of all these diseases, don't want to live near the rice paddies. So for the most part, they um, they live on the coast. They live in um, away from their plantations. And so um, this gives um, individuals the opportunity to have a little bit more um, freedom or liberty, if you will. Um, so they're able to, um, once they finish the tasks for that day, you know, maybe that's hoeing or pulling weeds or something in this certain plot, then they're able to go and work on their own small gardens, work on their own kind of um, trades if they are skilled in a certain area. And so this allows them to have um, some political and um, economic opportunities on their own, not so much political, um, but maybe within their own communities. And so this is really significant, and we're going to see um, those groups um, continue to to kind of um, fight and struggle for freedom throughout this course. Um, Quakers in Pennsylvania are the first ones to kind of turn against slavery. So this is the beginning of the anti-slavery movement, which eventually is going to culminate in the Civil War. Um, and cash, and because of the terrain, um, that I know some of you highlighted in your 13 colonies discussions. Um, in New England, the, the soil was just not, it did not lend itself to large scale agriculture. And so um, it, as a labor system, slavery never really took off, but we do see um, enslaved Africans um, working in New England, working um, in other regions, other colonies outside of the South, um, just doing different tasks. All right, um, so I'm turn it back to Mr. Bia. Okay, so we're going to discuss political culture in the colonies. Now, remember, this is still colonial America. This is not the United States of America. These are British colonists living in America. And that's really important to, to keep in the back of your mind as you're doing your reading, as you're preparing for uh, the exam this week. So in British North America, white male suffrage was far more widespread than Europe. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that the American colonists were just more woke to voting than the British were. It has a lot to do with land. Land 
was the the quintessential mark that you had a voice in the community land that you ownership control. so land ownership typically meant that you had a voice that you were a member of society that could make decisions so in british north america there were far more there was land was available um as long as you were willing to steal it from a native american but land was available and so was right color. yeah and you were like, right color. yes 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 it, you had to have privilege <laughs> but land ownership was far more widely uh, dispersed, I guess, for lack of a better word, than in Britain itself. So more white men were voting. Uh, because of that, society was a little bit more loose. It was less tightly controlled. There was more local control over local issues than you would see in Britain, where most decisions were being were coming out of London, were coming out of Parliament, uh, that there was decisions that were made over the entire island and colonies that were a little bit closer to Britain. So the American colonists very early on, they embraced this idea of the social contract that the government made decisions because the people put it in place to make decisions. This is going to be huge when we start talking about the revolutionary spirit because an American colonist is far more likely to respect and listen to a body that is making a decision close to it, like the House of Burgesses, for example, than the King of England who they did not give ownership of themselves over to, and they do not feel like the social contract uh, really met fit that person. They felt like it fit more the local control that they gave power to. Um, another interesting kind of phenomenon in the American colonial society is this idea of the print culture. American colonists read. They read nonstop anything that they could get their hands on, and pamphlets and newspaper, newspapers were often printed and circulated around communities, traded amongst neighbors. That you're going to see this uh, especially true in more uh, in city areas, more urban areas, uh, towns like Boston, in which print culture was rampant. And this is important because these are people exchanging ideas, not only in conversation and taverns or on the streets, but through the written word. And this is going to help kind of fan the flames of the revolutionary spirit that you begin to see spreading throughout the colonies. Um, in terms of women's rights, colonial women had more rights, relatively speaking, than their British counterparts. However, when a woman married in British North America, all her, her political and economic rights went to her husband, uh, whether it was land ownership, whether it was any voice that she had in the community, that went to her husband. So. Um, America, American colonial women on the eve of revolution really did not have much of a voice in society. During the revolution, uh, we will discuss ways in which women impacted it tremendously, but really their rights were hampered by their male overlords, I guess you could say, uh, up until pretty much 1776, in which you'll start to see women play a very active role in shaping the politics and the economics uh, during the Revolutionary War. All right, uh, Mr. Eskridge, back here um, to talk about the Great Awakening. All right, so um, just kind of taking a step back, we re remember that um, you know a lot of a lot of people traveled to North America um, seeking religious freedom, and so by the 1730s, by the 1740s, we have um, kind of the grandchildren of that generation, that original generation that had come over from England um, into this wilderness and had you know established the city on a hill, as we remember John Winthrop saying. Um, and so by this time, because of all these things that we talked about, because of consumer culture, because of the institution of slavery, because of people just getting settled, um, print culture, people reading um, other things that are going on. Uh, remember, the Enlightenment is happening at this time. So people are reading non-religious texts and really starting to question, um, you know, these long held structural norms um, that many times kept come down from the church. Um, they started to question, you know, what what is our role in society? And for the, the people that were still really connected um, to religion, they saw this as, you know, being very dangerous, that this was something that um, kind of spat in the face of their ancestors um, who had come here seeking religious freedom in order to, to build the city on a hill. And so we have the Great Awakening. And when we look retrospectively or kind of look at it um, historically, we see the Great Awakening as this kind of one of the things that's going to unify um, the colonies. But while it was happening, it was not necessarily that um, that was not the case. We saw these different um, preachers that are moving around. They're really mobile, um, working in different regions. So someone maybe in New England, 
um, maybe it's other people in the South, other middle colonies um, that are doing these kind of revival movements. So, you know, going out into a public space and preaching this really fiery um, message about how American society and American culture has gone away from its religious roots. Um, and there's a lot of people that, you know, that uh, lend a sensitive ear to that and join the movement, um, convert to Christianity, um, and, you know, are, are awoken, um, to kind of use the term from the, the historical um, name of it. Um, and so, but it is significant that this is really kind of the first mass movement um, of people um, that are kind of unified around a similar thing. And we're going to see that that unification is going to play out a little bit later in the American Revolution. Um, this also is exampled um, kind of this idea of unification by what Mr. Vieira was talking about with the print culture. So we have um, these texts, these sermons that are, um, you know, typed up or written out, not typed up, um, and then you know, printed. And so these are read throughout the colonies. So someone that, a preacher that may have exclusively lived and um, preached in New England may be being read by someone in the South. And so this this exchange of ideas um, is going on. So, um, you know, it's kind of the, the 18th century version of social media, kind of in a way, um, where people are feeling connected, even though um, they might be miles or, you know, hundreds of miles, thousands of miles apart from each other. So that's really significant. Um, and we're going to see a second great awakening and um, so on and so forth throughout the, this course. So this is kind of just the first one. So just kind of remember um, these major facts that are going on here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to discuss the Seven Years' War, and I just noticed a typo. It's also known as the French and Indian War. It's not the Seven Years' War, also known as the Seven Years' War. Uh, but, okay, so if war is your thing, this probably isn't the class for you. Uh, and what I mean by that is not to say that warfare is not significant and not to say that the sacrifice that people make for king, country, and God isn't important. It's just that's not a real focus of this class. Warfare tactics, battle tactics, that's not something that we really discuss. It's more a social history class. So when we talk about warfare, we're looking at the impact that the war had on society, the political, economic, and social ramifications of warfare. So, Seven Years' War. This is like the first actual world war um, that it's fought on many different continents, and it's primarily between England and France, but there's some other players involved. In terms of the North American conflict, the, the French had been encroaching upon English lands uh, in the American colonies, taking captives, in general kind of harassing uh, American colonists. So the war breaks out and many Americans, and we, we start to use that word Americans because the French and Indian War or the Seven Years War is really the first time where being an American is a thing. Uh, and the sentiment of being an American kind of starts to resonate amongst the colonists that perhaps there's something different than being British. But war breaks out. People die. It's terrible. Uh, a couple of things of note from the Seven Years' War. The Albany Congress, Benjamin Franklin, uh, creates sort of the, pers the one of the first political cartoons in, in human history, the Join or Die cartoon. He was, he was trying to unite the colonies under the Albany Congress to really support the war effort and to throw resources and money behind the English in support of the war. It ultimately fails. The colonies don't want to give up their sovereignty. They do not want to give up some of the decision-making power they had in order to support this war effort. Ultimately, what you need to know about the Seven Years' War itself, uh, as a result of it, the British win, they receive Canada, France is completely kicked out of North America, and really, in 1763, after the Treaty of Paris, Britain is the largest empire on Earth, and one of the largest empires in the history of mankind, and it pretty much is the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world at that point, I would say. Now, for American history, there's going to be some huge ramifications that, that result from the war. And ultimately, the beginning of the American Revolution is the end of the Seven Years' War. And so Mr. Eskridge is going to wrap this up with some of the impact that it had. All right. So, um, yeah, the... Uh... The, uh, the Seven Years' War really marked the beginning of the end of British um, control over the colonies. And um, as you can imagine, war is extremely expensive. And um, so Great Britain started to look at, you know, how are we going to pay for this war? And it makes a lot of sense, really, to, to tax the people, to charge the people in which you fought the war to protect. Um, and so the colonists, though, are like, eh, uh, that doesn't sound good. 
um, you know, again, they had enjoyed this consumptionism. They had enjoyed this relative freedom. All right. So, um, so like I said, um, so the war was really expensive. Um, the the British started to look at the, you know taxing the colonists. Um, you know that this is where they're going to get the money to pay for the war. The colonists were like, eh, no. They, they wanted to continue to enjoy this economic freedom. They did not want to pay taxes. Um, they did not want their economic livelihoods manipulated or changed or directed or controlled in any way. Um, and so we start to see these stirrings of the of what will be the American Revolution. Um, and you know this this affected many colonists, but as we're going to see, it was really the elite that Mr. Vieira kind of illuminated to before that are really going to feel the effects of these taxation, and they're really going to be the ones that are going to really vociferously speak out against them, um, um, such as Ben Franklin with the, the Albany Congress and other um, things like that. Um, another significant thing is the Proclamation Line of 1763, which basically said. Um, this is the line, colonists. This you cannot pass. This we are not. Britain said we are not willing to defend you past this line. Um, you cannot go further. And the American colonists are like, you can't tell us to do that. You know, we came here, landed on the coast, and have come this far. We're going. We're taking the whole pie, right? And um, we get to the where we we get to the where it seems the end, and we're going to go more. And we'll see this idea um, of the American frontier continue throughout an American culture, um, an American society, even even to today. Um, and so that's pretty much where we're going to wrap it up. But remember um, that the the American Revolution really begins at the end of the Seven Years' War. Um, and really now we have what will become the United States. So have a good weekend.